Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to speak uh, to so many curious people. Um, as, I, as Sarah said, I will be talking about coral reefs sort of uh, in, the, in the larger sense and about fishes, finances and fairy tales, which I know sounds very cryptic. But I wanna start by actually talking about the riveting topic of personal finance. Now, most of us have our money in either one of two accounts, either a checking account, which is sort of for the day-to-day -day turnover, we got our paychecks in there and that's where we pay our groceries from, or a savings account, which um, is supposed to accumulate over time because we're not spending everything that comes into our checking and eventually, hopefully, should buy us a nice piece of real estate. Um, now, if you're a millennial like myself, then your savings account probably isn't particularly large because you've spent way too much of your checking on avocado toast. Now, there are two observations here. The first one is that I do have an avocado problem. I really like those things and it doesn't really matter how much they cost. But the much more important part here is that whatever happens in our checking account is going to directly affect what happens in our savings. So ideally, if we wanna make sound financial decisions, we need to monitor both of these accounts quite closely. But of course, I'm not a financial advisor, thank God, because I wouldn't wanna give anybody the advice uh, I, can, I can give. Um, I'm an ecologist, and as an ecologist, I'm often tasked with assessing the health or the status of an ecosystem, much like a doctor may be tasked with assessing the health of a patient. And what ecologists do um, to, to assess ecosystems is lots and lots of counting. We might count the number of trees in the Amazon, or we might count the number of sharks on a reef, or the number of penguin colonies in Antarctica, or the number of elephants in the African savanna. And the general consensus here is that the more we have, the better it is. So lots and lots of sharks, that's great for a reef. But sharks, of course, don't just fall from the sky. Actually, if you were lucky enough to indulge in uh, watching Sharknado 1 through 5, you might disagree with both of those statements that more sharks are better and that sharks don't just drop from the sky. Also, did you realize that David Hasselhoff was in Sharknado 4? That's amazing to me. Anyways, outside of Sharknado, um, sharks definitely don't just drop from the sky they need to grow and they need to reproduce in order to increase their populations. And that can only happen if they gain energy, such as this shark is doing right here by feeding on a grouper, which therefore transfers energy and nutrients to the shark and can make more shark. So in reality, a lot of what we're seeing in nature really depends on these extremely dynamic processes, such as predation or decomposition or defecation, where energy and nutrients are transferred from one animal or one organism to the other. And really what this is, this is nature's financial um, system. Nature has a checking account that is the day-to-day -day turnover of energy and nutrients. And all of that goes into a savings account, which ends up being these large pools of biomass that are stored in the ecosystem by big fish or elephants or sharks or whatever. Now, with that knowledge, we can move to coral reefs. And I want you all to take just a couple of seconds to, to think about a coral reef. Now I imagine that most of you will have come up with something like this. And even though it might slightly differ, I would almost bet that everybody has two uh, characteristics in their coral reef image. The first one is blue clear water, which allows us to see these vibrant colors on a coral reef. And the second one is these large schools of, of fish that are just everywhere milling around and just a tremendous amount of diversity and life. And those two actually don't match up at all. The reason for that is 
that the blue clear water suggests that there are almost no nutrients or energy in the water. Water that has lots of energy and nutrients is green because you get all the small um, algae proliferating in it, creating a lot of food at the base of the food web. So you have no nutrients or energy in the water, yet you have these many, many mouths of fish that need to be fed and this huge amount of biomass that is created on coral reefs. And I'm not the first one to figure this out, trust me. In fact, old Charles Darwin, uh, father of evolutionary biology and also the perennial Best Beard in Science Award winner, um, was musing about this in the 1800s. And he said, this shouldn't be the case. Coral reefs should not have so much life because they're literally in marine deserts. Now, that's why this is actually called Darwin's paradox. We don't understand it, we can't explain it. There have been a, a few attempts to explain it that highlight the contributions of different organisms. So one of them, for example, said that corals themselves feed the reef by secreting all this slime everywhere that is very high in carbon and therefore can feed the reef. A different theory suggests that sponges, as you see in the upper right, um, may feed the reef by recycling a lot of the dead particulate matter that floats through the water. And then there's been a theory that the, the reef itself actually makes sure that there's enough energy by retaining everything, uh, by shifting the ocean currents to retain everything within sort of a halo of the reef system. And those might all be true. But what I wanna talk about today is the contribution of a group um, that you can see in this photograph, fishes. And yes, I'm talking about all the fish you can see in this photo, the fish that you can see swimming around in that photo, and all the fish in that photo as well, except for that tiny little fish you can see in the back right there. Now you're gonna say, oh, great, we're about seven minutes in and the speaker has lost it completely already. Um, I can promise you that is not the case. In fact, those photos were actually swarming with fish. You just didn't see them because they're about this big. This is what we call a cryptobenthic fish or just short crypto. And as you can see, these fishes come in all shapes and colors, but really only in three size classes. And that's small, smaller, and extra small. But what is a cryptobenthic fish? What is a crypto? Well, the first mention of that term was actually in 1979 by a guy called PJ Miller, who said that cryptobenthic fish are small body fish that exploit restricted habitats where food and shelter are obtained in or in relation to conditions of substrate complexity and or restricted living space with a physical barrier likely to be interposed between the small fish and sympatric predators. That's a mouthful and that scientists speak for, these are small fish that like to hide. Now that's a bit of an ambiguous definition. So a clownfish, for example, is really quite small. And a mora eel really likes to hide, but they're really different. So what we needed was a slightly better definition of what these fish actually are. So what I did in, in a paper in 2018 was I weeded through the uh, size distributions of all the reef fishes we know. These are families of fishes, which is the gibberish in Latin on the left. And that amounted to about 6,300 species. And I looked at their size and I said, hey, if a family has more than 10% of really small fish, which in that case is um, fish species that are smaller than 50 millimeters or about two inches, then this group, uh, this family shall henceforth be a cryptobenthic fish family. And lo and behold, we get 17 families that satisfy these criteria. And as you can see, the, the proportion of these small species ranges quite widely, but it goes up to about 90% of species within a family being smaller than two inches. That's really small. These are the Peter Pans of the reef fish world. They spend their entire lives in a size spectrum that is actually reserved for small juvenile fish. The other thing we can notice when we look at this graph is that there isn't actually a whole lot of uh, variation in the families that don't satisfy the criteria. As a matter of fact, there's hardly any families that switch 
uh, that would switch their designation if we if we shifted that threshold because most of them don't have small species at all. So in other words, being a cryptobenthic fish family requires commitment and most families just don't do that at all. So now that we know kind of what these fish are, let's take a look at how many of these cryptobenthic fish there actually are out there. And we can first start by looking at the diversity of cryptobenthic fish species. And that's actually not that easy because these fishes are so small that we have a difficult time actually describing them. So this is what scientists have done over the past few centuries in terms of describing reef fishes. And you can see that the, the description by these taxonomists that, that put names on different species and say, this is a species has steadily increased for large reef fishes. But for cryptobenthics, that is a completely different pattern because the first hundred years or so, people didn't describe any of them because they simply couldn't find them, which is not surprising at all. But in the past few decades in particular, those description rates have absolutely skyrocketed. And if we sort of stay on this trajectory, our best prediction is that there are about 4,000 species of these cryptobenthic fishes, which means that there's about 1,500 that are yet to be described. The other questions you may have is how many of these fish are there on a reef? And again, this is not easy. So this is a photograph of about half a square meter of fairly scungy reef in, uh, in Tonga. And normally I would ask how many fish there are in this photo, but because we have the chat box and it's a bit clunky, I'm just gonna tell you, there's 20 cryptobenthic fish on this very small patch of reef. Now, as you can imagine, swimming over the reef and trying to count these things when they move is really, really difficult. So we have a different technique that is not partic particularly subtle or kind, but does the job. These are what we call anesthetic stations. And essentially, we'll just put a, a big bell-shaped net over the reef. Then we put literally a tent, the, the, the tarp of a tent over it, and spray an anesthetic into this area, which in our case is usually clove oil. Uh, smells beautiful, smells like Christmas all the time. Um, once that clove oil has, has worked, we kind of peel back the nets and pick up all the fish with tweezers, put them in tiny little bags. And at the end of the, uh, the dive, we come away with this bag full of fish. Now this technique hasn't been applied a whole lot. This is the global distribution of these quantitative um, censuses of cryptobenthic fishes. The blue dots are the tropics and the yellow dots are outside the tropics. And you can see that we have a long way to go. But where people have done these surveys, they have found that these cryptobenthic fishes are very, very abundant. As a matter of fact, the average density of these fishes per square meter of reef is about 15 or 20 individuals. So if you scale that up to a reef, that's a tremendous amount of tiny fish. All right, a little more about these fish in terms of what they do. Well, they do what every organism in the world actually does. They do three things. They grow, they survive, and they reproduce. But, and you may have guessed this, all three of these things become a lot more difficult if you're the size of a very, very, very small jelly bean. In terms of the growth, um, the problem that these fish have is that their metabolism, the way in which they use energy to sustain their bodily functions and move around, um, their metabolism gets more expensive as they get smaller. So a very small fish has to work much harder to stay nourished than a larger fish. And as a consequence of that, these fish actually have to spend a tremendous amount of time foraging up to 65% of the time in some species, which actually probably isn't that far away from me during the past year of this pandemic. The second thing is survival. And again, when you're that small, survival becomes difficult. These are the average maximum lifespans of uh, six families of cryptobenthic fishes, and these are in months. 
So as you can see, the vast majority of these families have maximum lifespans that are less than a year. And as a matter of fact, the uh, dwarf goby genus Eviota, of which you can see a representative right here, holds the record for the shortest recorded vertebrate, vertebrate lifespan with a whopping three weeks of adult life. That's not a lot. And of course they don't live long because they're eaten by just about everything. This is a cryptobenthic fish eating another cryptobenthic fish. These fishes are just picked off the reef left, right, and center wherever something can get their jaws or mandibles on these fish. And I can't blame anything either because these fish really do look like candy as well. The third part is reproduction. And you probably know the drill by now, it's also really difficult when you're small. These are some ghost gobies that live on a sponge and you can see their clutch of eggs, which they stick to the, uh, to the substrate. And that's not a lot of eggs. Compared to all the other large fish, which produce millions and millions of eggs at a time, this is a minuscule amount of offspring. And the reason for that is that these fish simply don't have more space in their bodies to produce more eggs. Eggs have to be a minimum size to actually be viable. And so these fish simply can't have any more. And as a matter of fact, there are species that have as few as 34 eggs per clutch. If you only have such few eggs, you better make sure that these eggs hatch. And so cryptobenthics will engage in the most creative ways of making sure that their babies actually hatch from the eggs, such as, for example, this jawfish, which is uh, a mouth brooding species, meaning that the male will take the eggs in its mouth and will leave them there until they hatch, not feed, almost starve, and generally be pretty miserable. So being a cryptobenthic fish is really, really difficult. And you might sit there now and say, well, okay, I have two questions, Simon. First of all, if the, these fishes have such a hard time, and if there are so many mouths on coral reefs that slurp up cryptobenthics all the time, how come there are any of these fish left on a reef? And the second question you may ask yourself is why? Why do I care? about these fish at all? What is it that makes these fish so special that I have to listen to an entire lecture about them? Well, I can answer both of these questions, but to do that, and this is not what you wanted to hear, I'm sure, we have to go even smaller. We have to look at the larval stages of reef fishes and what they do to the dynamics on a coral reef. So I have to do a little bit of brushing up on our knowledge here. The general life cycle of a reef fish is that eggs are being spawned either in the water column or they are stuck to the um, to the substratum, and and afterwards bred by the uh, by the parents. Um, but in either either case, either the eggs will simply be carried away by the current, or the larvae will hatch and go into the current, and they go go away into the deep blue ocean. We don't actually really know where most of them go, but we do know that they're out there in the open ocean, drifting around. And then eventually after, you know, on average three weeks, three to four weeks, these larvae will show up at a reef somewhere, either the same reef that they came from or a different reef. They'll show up, they'll settle onto the reef and then start growing. Now, the tragedy here is, that the vast majority, and we're talking 99.9% .9 of these larvae will never make it there. They will go out there into the big blue ocean and be lost forever because that is an absolutely terrible place to be. There's no food, uh, there are plenty of predators, it's generally just absolutely awful. And so it's a death sentence for the average larva. However, the ones that do eventually make it to the reef we can sample those and we can take stock of which larvae actually make it back to a reef. So this is the island of Lizard Island um, that you see in the top. And this is me driving a boat in Belize. Yeah, I just kind of merged those two photos together. But what we can do is we can essentially 
drive a boat, a small boat around the edge of the reef right here, just where it starts to get deep around the reef. And this boat will have a net attached to it that samples even the smallest organisms. And therefore we can, we can sample all the larvae that are in the water and then analyze them. People have done this for decades. They've started in the 1970s doing this and sampling larvae everywhere they can. And on this map, all of the dots are studies that people have done using this exact technique. So from all of these dots, we have some knowledge as to what the community of larvae is that arrives on a reef. And the gist here is that cryptobenthic fishes absolutely dominate this pool of larvae. The waters around coral reefs are crypto larvae soup. Up to three quarters and sometimes even more, depending on which region you're in, of the ichthyoplankton, the, the reef fish larvae, are cryptobenthics. Now you might say, well, that's not surprising. You just said there's a lot of these fish on the reef. So naturally they produce a lot of offspring and they have most of the larvae that come back. So in a sense, we might envision a relationship that is simply linear where cryptobenthic uh, adults uh, put out the most, uh, the most offspring into the water and then get back most of the larval supply. But that's not quite the case. If we look at the large reef fishes, which are the ones that you know, spawn all of these eggs into the water column, and then eventually the larvae come back, there is a very, very weak relationship between how much the adults put out and how much is coming back. For cryptobenthics, it's a completely different ballgame. They hardly contribute anything to the output of gametes on a coral reef but they get back the bulk of the larvae. So what is happening? Well, the answer to that is we don't know, but our best guess is that these cryptobenthic larvae actually don't go anywhere. They skip that step that is so dangerous and so lethal for the vast majority of larvae by simply staying around the reef. They might be spawned somewhere here in the lagoon or just off the reef, and then the larvae go off somewhere where we don't know, but they come back in droves. So that's how these cryptobenthics are able to maintain their populations. They have this steady supply of larvae that basically is a conveyor belt of new individuals that are coming in as soon as an adult is being eaten. So what does that mean for the reef? Well, if we take all the larvae that are coming back with the respective proportions that we know, and we let these fish grow, and then at the end of the day, we look at how much biomass these fishes produce. Well, if we look at that, then I gotta tell you that cryptobenthic don't do a lot for the reef at all. The relative produced biomass by cryptobenthic fishes is a fraction of what large reef fishes produce. And that is not too surprising. I mean, if you look at this photo, if I went to this reef and like the old days, I you know throw some dynamite on the reef and then harvest everything that comes back, I'm probably gonna find that these large reef fishes massively outweigh the cryptobenthics. But there's something we haven't accounted for in this honestly quite reasonable way of thinking. Let's try this again. We're again going with the uh, larval pool in the beginning, but now we put predation into all of this. And now we account for all the fish that are being eaten during that time. Because remember I told you earlier, these fish are eaten constantly. Well, now we find a different picture. This is the turnover of each population per year. And we can see that cryptobenthic fishes are absolutely through the roof. Um, as a matter of fact, per year, they have about 700% turnover, which equates to about seven replacements for each individual. And this has a tremendous effect 
on the consumed biomass of reef fishes on a coral reef, with cryptobenthic fishes counting for about 60% of the consumed fish flesh on any given coral reef. Or if you look at a big grouper, you can think about this grouper as being about 60% cryptobenthics. That's quite the number, but this number will never show up because these fishes simply settle, grow, and die and get replenished faster than we can ever survey them. Or in other words, these fishes are a true cryptocurrency. They're there, they feed the reef, but we don't really have a good way of monitoring them. So if you think back just to the beginning of this lecture where I said, hey, there's the checking and the savings account in, um, um, in nature as well as in our personal finance. When we go to a coral reef and we see those schools of fishes um, in, in, this, in this clear water that doesn't hold a lot of nutrients, we're looking at the savings account. And this savings account, as a matter of fact, supports the livelihoods of about 500 million people worldwide. So this is why we should care about the cryptos, because they are the checking account that underpins the production of biomass that ultimately supports human livelihoods globally. Now, the question is, how are we doing with monitoring that checking account? Are we doing a good job taking stock of these cryptos? Well, I can answer that question. We're doing about as well as this guy is tending to his checking account. And that's a problem, but it's also not surprising. And the reason for that is this photograph right here. Look at it for a second. And I'm gonna bet that 99% of you all, as would I, have immediately focused on this beautiful peacock grouper that is in the center of the photograph and stands out and is just glorious reef fish in all his uh, splendor. And I bet none of you noticed the beautiful little gobies that are right here, beautiful cryptobenthic fish and nobody uh, cared to even look at them. And that's normal. That's what I call the panda paradigm. We are generally attracted to and much more likely to notice and protect and monitor things that are either fluffy or cute or at least somewhere within the size spectrum that we can actually readily see. And that's an issue because that guides all of our conservation efforts and that guides all of our ways of interacting with nature. Or as the uh, Senegalese conservationist Baba Dioum put it once, in the end, we will only conserve what we love. Luckily, however, there is actually a second part to this quote, which is we will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we're taught. And I hope that today I was able to foster at least a little bit of understanding, love, and hopefully some conservation of these tiny little Peter Pans of the reef fish world and their contributions to the coral reef savings account. Thank you very much. Simon, thank you so much. That was really amazing. So, so I, I have a question that I'm dying to ask you. Um, given that we know that um, it's predicted that coral bleaching events are um, going to increase in number, um, do you have any data that suggests, like, with your cryptobenthic fish, um, you know, are are they going to be more impacted by coral bleaching? Or are they um, going to be less? What, what might happen to them? That's a very good question. So coral bleaching is obviously mediated by temperature. So when the temperature ramps up, the coral starts bleaching. It you know, stays in that, that pale white state for quite a while, and then it normally dies. So there are actually, there are two factors to consider in this. The first one is the coral dying. The second one is the temperature itself, which is what drives the coral bleaching. 
When it comes to bleaching, it's actually quite, quite amazing because these cryptobenthic fishes rarely associate with live coral. The coral is kind of like a jellyfish. And so it's not particularly pleasant to associate with a live coral. It has all these stinging cells. It's not particularly nutritious. It offers shelter for some specialized species, but the vast majority of, of cryptobenthics don't actually like live coral very much. What they do like is dead coral um, because dead coral, you can actually see it in this, in this photo right here. Uh, dead coral will grow this little fuzz right there, which is, a, which is an algae. It's not particularly pretty to look at, but it actually fosters these communities of tiny little crabs and tiny little snails and everything that the, many of the cryptos love to eat. And that particular species you see right here actually loves to eat the algae itself. So what that means is that after a bleaching event, we actually see this spike in cryptobenthic fish abundance because the cryptos are absolutely loving it. The problem, however, is that if the coral doesn't come back, eventually the waves will simply erode the structure of the reef and you'll end up with a flat pavement that has nowhere to hide for the cryptobenthics. And that's a problem. The other problem is temperature itself. And I actually have some data that I, that I could show um, from what is the, uh, yeah, actually I got it right here, um, from what happens to be the world's hottest coral reefs in the United Arab Emirates. Um, so, so here in the Arabian Gulf, you can see the, the, red, um, the red zone down here is right in front of Abu Dhabi. And it is the world's hottest coral reef with uh, summer temperatures being sustained at about 36 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, bathtub kind of temperature. And then we have the, the Gulf of Amman, which is right here, which is actually quite a normal coral reef environment. And what I did is I went there to sample these cryptobenthic fishes to get an idea of how cryptobenthics might cope with hotter temperatures. And the bottom line is that they won't cope very well. Um, we've got the Arabian Gulf where it's hot in blue right here and the uh, Gulf of Oman um, in pink right there. And we can see that there's about a third the number of species in the Arabian Gulf and that there's about uh, one sixth the number of fish, of cryptobenthic fishes in the Arabian Gulf. And if we do the, uh, the math and assess sort of the contributions of these, these fish to coral reef energy cycling, as I just showed in my presentation, you find that the cryptobenthic communities there in the Arabian Gulf are about 10% of what they are in other coral reef ecosystems. And that's quite concerning because that suggests that these fish may not cope very well with temperatures that are, um, that are rising. Okay, and so you touched a little bit on one of our next questions, um, which was what do cryptobenthics typically eat? You talked a little bit about the algae and um, can you expand yeah. on that a little bit? Absolutely. Actually, I happen to have a slide about that too. Um, lucky me. So this is, this is our best knowledge about what different cryptobenthic fishes eat. The answer to that question is lots and lots of very small things. So there are some that are essentially herbivorous. So they will eat um, the, the algae and a lot, of the, a lot of the detritus that accumulates on a coral reef. So this is a layer of you know, um, dead cells, scales, um, poop, and all sorts of more or less tasty things that accumulate as this sort of sediment on a coral reef. And some, some families like the blennies will absolutely love that stuff. Most of the others are fairly omnivorous. They will take almost everything they can get their jaws on because they need the energy. Um, so essentially this is like, like you being constantly starving and then having a, a buffet and you're just loading up wherever you can as fast as possible. Okay, and so we have a parasitologist in the crowd who is bemoaning the fact that yes, your panda paradigm is totally true. So it's true, parasitologists must get tired of that all the time. Um, I bet. We also have a question that is, what is the best way to help prevent coral bleaching and promote reef conservation from day to day? 
Right. So first of all, um, my condolences to the parasitologist because I mean, with the cryptos, at least I have some leg to stand on when it comes to cute and cuddly. Uh, with the parasites, that gets even more difficult. Um, so I'm very sorry, but we know that parasites rule the world. Um, with regards to coral reef conservation, I think this is really, um, this is a two-pronged two kind of approach. On one hand, there is no way we can ignore sort of the big picture policy decisions that are being made in our world to curb global stressors that will affect coral reefs. I mean, in the past 20 years, we've seen um, the most devastating large scale bleaching events that, um, that are known to, to mankind. The Australian Great Barrier Reef, which is generally free of many of the local stressors such as heavy fishing, um, had a bleaching event in uh, in 2016, 2017 that absolutely devastated this you know incredible ecosystem. So there's no way around trying to address issues like climate change at the at the basis of large scale policy decisions. When it comes to more local um, contributions and impacts. I think there is a case to be made for that being very effective. So essentially we're thinking about a, a system that is exposed to this you know, monstrosity of, of rising temperatures. And we wanna make sure we do everything we can to put these reefs in a position to cope with it. That means curbing fishing, curbing uh, pollution, curbing um, sedimentation. So everything that locally affects a reef is something that we can address and that will help ultimately. What we can do from, you know, sort of our, our armchairs is a different question. We can support um, organizations that are committed to coral reef, um, coral reef conservation. There's plenty of coral reef restoration going on. I think it's an avenue that could be successful, but it is a, it is a contentious topic in coral reef science because some people will bemoan the fact that resources are being expanded on trying to recreate something that cannot be recreated because we don't understand it. And this is really something where even in coral reef science, which is probably one of the most advanced marine, uh, marine disciplines, uh, we're still lagging behind the terrestrial realm where we just have a much better understanding of how the ecosystems function. And as I've just shown in my talk, there are still so many gaps for us in terms of understanding how the energy flows through the system to ultimately create these ecosystems that we all admire and love and want to preserve. And that's the concern with coral reef restoration that we might be putting all these corals out there to essentially create the shell of an ecosystem that doesn't resemble the real deal in any way, shape or form. Okay, somebody wants to know what accounts for the amazing diversity of color and shape for the cryptos? That is a great question. Would you like to study it? Um, so as you will find probably in this Q&A session, um, there's a lot of things we don't know about cryptobenthic fishes. Um, the amazing colors actually believe it or not, are often a camouflage um, for the cryptos. So, you know, they live in this extremely colorful environment. And as a consequence, they have to somehow adapt to the patterns. But we also need to remember that a lot of the color we see is not seen the same way by fish that live underwater. The fact is that a coral reef is such a clear water environment that visual cues are very, very important. And so these species communicate with their with their coloration all the time. If you if you go swimming out here, um, I don't know off the jet off the jetty in uh, in Corpus Christi, you probably won't see a lot of color. And the reason for that is that the water most of the year is kind of green, kind of brown. So being silver or something along these lines is a lot more useful than having all these amazing colors if nothing can see them. 
Uh, this particular Blenny that you actually see in this photograph right here has this beautiful just indigo um, patch on its throat. And that is almost certainly a, um, a sexual display. So again, it works really well for these fishes to communicate with color. So this, this male right there is simply presenting its colors and saying, look ladies, I'm, I'm the guy right here. I'm sitting in my hole and I've got the most beautiful color. Why don't you move in? And so simply the diversity of cryptobenthics then fosters this, this amazing diversity, so diversity of colors that is really, really quite amazing. And also it helps to have a very good friend and collaborator who's an amazing underwater photographer. Your pictures, yeah, are amazing. Um, so we're going to give you a pass on this next question if you don't know the answer because you've only been here a few weeks but someone asked does the gulf and i'm going to assume here they mean the gulf of mexico have large populations of cryptobenthic fish i i will happily answer that question um the answer is that we don't know if you um if we look back at the um at the uh map of where people have really sampled cryptobenthics, we see that there's a massive hole in the Gulf right here. Um, this is something I'm hoping to change. Um, there's definitely cryptobenthics on the jetties. There's definitely cryptobenthics on the docks in all of these estuaries that we have here in, in South Texas. And there's most certainly cryptobenthics on the oil rigs in the Gulf. There's cryptobenthics on the deep reefs like the flower garden banks. Um, the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, that unless we you know, sample them quantitatively, take them out of the water, take photographs, look at them under a microscope, take a fin clip, ID them, we have no way of telling what they are because they're so small, they're so cryptic, it's simply impossible to do that. Um, to do that in, in the water while scuba diving or, you know, let alone being in a submersible or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done and I'm super excited about um, starting up a program that can, you know, shed some light on the populations of cryptobenthics in the Gulf of Mexico. And we'll see what comes out of that. I I should have known that you would know the answer, to, so I apologize for <laughs> Well, it wasn't really that much knowledge. It was more assumptions, but. So we did have a question. Um, someone was interested in um, sort of how to get started in this kind of career. Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, so I actually initially wanted to be a journalist. I've always said I'm gonna be a journalist um, one day and but I felt like I needed something to talk about as a journalist and have an area of expertise and I decided that biology was what interested me the most and so I did a degree in just general biology and then I I knew that marine ecosystems were always the most interesting to me so I um I tried to get a little more expertise in marine science. So I went to do my graduate degree, a master's in, in coral reef ecology, and I just got hooked on it. And I think the, the main ingredient that one needs to have to start this career and also be successful in this career is curiosity. You simply need to have the urge to ask questions and answer them. And that has, that has really helped me in my career as I've moved forward. I've simply looked at different topics constantly and been like, why is it? What are we looking at here? And this sort of thirst for knowledge, I think, is really all that one needs to start a career in marine science. And I, I also want to mention that a lot of people will tell you that to succeed in science, you need to be, you know, um, ace all your math exams and, you know, no physics and chemistry and everything. And you need to be, you know, some kind of, of genius in your own way with the natural sciences. And I do not think that that is true. I, I love statistics now. 
So I spend an awful lot of time on my computer coding and running different analyses and I have fun doing it. But I hated math in school. I hated math in school. I hated statistics in undergrad. So it really isn't, isn't anything that, uh, that would prevent you from embarking on a career as a scientist if you're willing to put in the work. So honestly, I think everybody can be a scientist if they're simply curious enough. Well, Simon, I can't tell you all the comments in the chat box that are thanking you for such an amazing presentation. I, and... I'm not seeing the chat box, but thank you. <laughs> right, which is why I'm kind of feeding everything to you. But there's lots of comments about what it was. It was a really great presentation. Everyone's very appreciative. There's a couple of welcome to Texas. And thank you. Um, so we are most appreciative of this talk. And I think you have actually made it through all the questions. And so if we don't have any other questions, um, I think we can say good night.